Yeah, I guess we can start our learning practice. <laughs> okay, they'll drift in. Um, you, what, most of you know uh, some of um, I will just introduce him briefly. Mr. Thomas has been my first uh, um, boss since I came back from the US. <laughs> <laughs> And um, well, besides having the very uh, uh, long uh, experience of uh, working as an educator in, uh, in the United States, he has been uh, co-founder of the American Academy in the D.C. at the Boston School, uh, who has shaped really the um, uh, foundations of the school. And um, today he's going to deliver um, a speech or He's going to talk about the square of curriculum as a speak. And um, we usually have the opportunity afterwards uh, to uh, discuss uh, the presentation. So we hope for your participation. Thank you. Uh, yes, I was his boss, and now he's the professor, and I'm, <laughs> I'm the teacher. Well, uh, Simon called me up um, on Monday uh, afternoon and said, wouldn't you like to give a lecture on Thursday? So um, I've been a little pressed. But um, it does give me an opportunity to talk about something that I've been thinking about for a very long time. And it's kind of complicated. Uh, but I thought I would um, run it out there and see, see what we can get. Um, this has a little bit of history uh, that I need to uh, talk about um, because it uh, it talks about where this where this all came from and how I arrived at this. Um, in 1968, I um, began teaching a curriculum that I had uh, prepared uh, in uh, graduate school at uh, Brookline High School outside of Boston. Um, a public school of uh, 2,500 uh, students. And um, this was a course uh, called Semiotics. Um, it has the uh, dubious honor of being the only course in semiotics in the world, as far as I know, that's taught in secondary school. Um, and uh, I labored at this uh, for about uh, 10 years. And then uh, it became popular enough so that other teachers uh, had to take part. And um, then I was uh, fortunate enough to get a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities, uh, which uh, specified that I would write, it's an impossibly ambitious task, that I would write four textbooks and that I would train 20 teachers uh, in uh, 11 public schools in the greater Boston area to teach semiotics. So uh, I mention this um, because uh, I've had the experience of building a curriculum from the ground up. And uh, it was a curriculum that, um, that had some very special demands because nobody knew what semiotics was. And so I had to really start from zero. And, um, and create this thing piece by piece. Um, so that's uh, the way, uh, that's, that's the background of this. Um, and since that time, I've been very concerned about uh, curriculum and how it, it is developed. And uh, I've decided to call this um, the square of curriculum. Um, and I want to start out with uh, an analogy. Um, and the analogy is between uh, language and curriculum. Let's look at language first. First of all, you have uh, vocabulary, which is the, um, the most unstable aspect of language. It's the part of language that changes, changes the most. Words are coming in uh, the language and going out of the language <clears throat> at a great rate, okay? 
And so it's the most unstable part, the most ever-changing part of language. And uh, the next is uh, usage, which really refers to habits of uh, speaking, uh, the way people speak a particular language. Now, this can be a dialect, um, or it can be, um, for example, English is, is um, spoken in uh, many countries, but it's uh, spoken in different ways. And so there are certain rules of usage, um, uh, but uh, it's a little bit more stable than the vocabulary. And then finally at the bottom, you have uh, what is called a grammar. Some people confuse grammar and usage. Um, the grammar is the system that generates um, all of the above. In other words, um, it is the most stable part of, of, uh, of language. And it is able to, uh, even though its uh, rules are fixed, it's able to generate potentially inexhaustible numbers of uh, things have said. Okay, so it enables us to say something that has never been said before. There's a fam famous phrase by the uh, linguist uh, Noam Chomsky. He said, colorless green ideas sleep furiously. Something that nobody ever said. But that's what a grammar enables us to say. Whether it makes sense or not doesn't matter. It's grammatical. Okay? So let's go over to curriculum. In curriculum, uh, it's content that is uh, like the vocabulary. The content in curriculum is what shifts the most, okay? Um, and uh, to some extent, it's, it's practically all that is shifted. That is, you just, uh, you teach a different set of books or you teach a different set of problems, uh, uh, a different set of experiments. Um, this is why you're, you're, you have that kind of flexibility, okay, um, in doing a curriculum. Underneath it, uh, next, uh, that would be like usage, which is not, not, not so uh, fluid, would be uh, method. So there are different methods of teaching, whether it's going to be lecture, or it be a method, or it's going to be interactive method or discussion, okay? But uh, method is, is, is more difficult to learn. Uh, it's more difficult to apply uh, and to adapt. So it changes uh, more slowly. Um, the method is sort of subject to fashion, as is content. So then we move down here to this bottom level here, grammar. And um, we have to ask ourselves, what is that? In, uh, in, the, in the aspect of curriculum, what is underneath all of this? And it, uh, the an my answer to that is that uh, there should be something that um, is a curriculum itself. In other words, it's a curriculum of a curriculum. If you see, that's a curriculum squared. That's what I mean by the square of curriculum. That is to say, is there some way in which a curriculum should be developed? Okay? That it wouldn't be as solid as a grammar of course, okay? But is, is, is there a set of processes, you know? Is there a set of, we, I suppose we could call them rules, um, for, for generating curriculum? 